Hey listeners, Hit the Books is available everywhere you get your podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, YouTube, and more. Be sure to tune in each week and like, rate, and subscribe. What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to season two, episode twenty-nine of Hit the Books. What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to season two, episode twenty-nine of Hit the Books, the podcast where we dive deep into the world of sports and sports gambling. Each episode, we break down the latest news and trends, provide analysis and commentary, and offer up our best bets and betting advice. Whether you're a seasoned sports gambler or just getting started, our goal is to provide you with the insights and knowledge you need to make informed decisions and come out ahead. So sit back, relax, and let's hit the books. This week, we have a huge week ahead of us with March Madness starting and so much action happening in the NFL offseason, more than we can cover there in the NFL. So we got a whole slate for you guys today, and I'm excited to jump in. So let's start off like we do each and every week by introducing my co-hosts, Huff, Ace, and Mackie. Mackie, let's start off with you this week. What do you got for me? What's going on, guys? Yeah, best week of the year, in my opinion. Um, you know, we got March Madness starting tomorrow. We got the first four. We had it last night and tonight. Pitt, Pitt had a nice game last night against Mississippi State. I know Huff was on the right side of that one. Uh, Mississippi State misses with buzzer beater to um, to win the game. So we're starting off March hot, uh, just getting getting in the full swing of things. And there's a lot of NFL news out recently in free agency and uh, in trading. So a lot to talk about. Um, not much else going on. Send it back to you, Jesse. Good stuff, Mackie. Great to hear from him, from you for another week here. Ace, let's send it over to you next. What do you got for us? Nice to see you, buddy. Hey, how's it going, boys? I'm ready to be back for another week here. I mean, we got the the voice and the video rolling, so what's better than that? The boys are in business. But, um, yeah, like Mackie said, great time of year here. We got March Madness heating up. So, you know, I'm a big college uh, basketball guy now. So for this month, uh, definitely tune in for our picks. I'll be tailing Huff and Mackie. I hope the rest of you do as well. And uh, got some great NHL and NBA games going along, and now some NFL news too. So looking forward to getting some more sports here this week. Big week ahead, Ace. Love to hear from you, buddy. Huff, let's finish it off with you here for these intros, and let's jump into what we got this week. What do you got for me, buddy? Yeah, what's going on? Uh, happy to be back. Like everyone said, March Madness gets rolling. The official tournament underway tomorrow, Thursday. Um, like you said, Ace, NBA, NHL, full swing, starting to get down to you know, the nitty-gritty last couple of great regular season games in each of these leagues and get down to the playoff picture that we're going to be looking at come uh, April, May. Um, other than that, like you said, a lot of stuff going on in the NFL, free agents uh, going everywhere, lots of trades going on, lots of stuff to get into. Definitely going to be a good episode, one I've been looking forward to throughout this week. Um, but uh, one thing I do want to highlight on, but other than uh, college basketball, our NBA card has absolutely caught fire over the past week. I think we're up over uh, 12 and a half units on that one now. Uh, so with a little dip that we've taken in the NHL, we're not going to hide that, but uh, we've been picking it back up in the uh, NBA. So uh, it's important taking all the plays across all the cards and uh, like Ace said, hoping to keep rolling in college basketball come tomorrow and um, got a play going tonight. Arizona State minus two, Mackey, I believe is what we ended up going with. So uh, hoping we can start the tournament off right, but um, looking to keep rolling here. Looks like Mackey's tweeting that out now. Good stuff, Puff. Lots to look forward to this week. NHL, MLB, college basketball, NFL. So, and so much more. So why don't we just jump right in? Why don't we uh why don't we start off with the MLB? We only got one point here. Former uh Cy Young winner Trevor Bauer has signed a one year contract with the Yokohama Dene Bay Stars of Nipton Professional Baseball in Japan. Well he he'll rejoin professional baseball for the first time in nearly two years, following a long suspension and release from the Los Angeles Dodgers. What do you guys think about this? Him rejoining professional baseball? But over in Japan, officially never hear from him again. Uh, 
I, I honestly thought he, there was a chance he was coming back into the league. At least I thought I was seeing like swirlings of that in the news for a couple of weeks over the past uh, maybe several or so months. But I don't know. I, I guess definitely a elite player. It's tough to see what happened to him in his career, what he did. But um, obviously, I'm not going to be watching too many Japanese baseball games. That's just me. I don't know about you guys. If you guys are staying up, or I don't even know what time those games would be, but. It's probably like a 12-hour-ish difference, something like that. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm watching too many uh, Japanese baseball games, but... I think he got what he wanted. He made his bag, and now he's just do, fucking around in the, in the sport of baseball. I mean, obviously, he can go over and just tear apart any Japanese league he goes to. But, um, I mean, he, he what, he signed a $300 million contract, and then he didn't play the next two years, so... um, I don't know. I think he's pretty fine with what's going on. Yeah, I mean, it's just great to see him be able to keep playing baseball. Um, obviously, some weird situations he's been involved with and don't really know the full extent of that off the top of my head. But um, a great pitcher nonetheless. It looked like he was going to be a future face of baseball almost on the mound. So we'll see what he can do overseas and uh, maybe make his way back to the MLB eventually when things die down. Yeah, good stuff there out of the MLB. Lots more to look forward to here as opening day approaches even though that's not really even about the MLB, but sort of, kind of. All right, I think it's time. Let's jump into some March Madness basketball. It's that time of the year. Games are here starting. The first four happening last night, uh, Tuesday, and tonight, Wednesday, as well as, I believe, and games starting here on Thursday. And we have Alabama being awarded the number one seed overall this year in March Madness. Purdue, Kansas, and Houston as number one seeds in their respective regions. Let's go over some things to look forward to this week or this year in March Madness. One uh, trend that I believe Huff put in here is teams with 60% or more of the bets on the spread are 56, 80, and 5, hitting at just 41.2% against the spread in March Madness since 2016. So $100 better would be down $2,812 over that course. Very interesting thought to think about there with uh, lots of these possibly, you know, number one seeds coming in with lots of money on them, even though they come to prove as they don't lose in the first round from, uh, we're going to find that stat somewhere. What do you guys think about this one? Yeah, I mean, this is obviously something that, you know, every sports gambler they look at going into each and any game, whether it's a typical Tuesday NHL game or you know, March Madness, where you have a lot of new time gamblers coming in. You know, you have your the your certain sports times throughout the year where a lot of new people get into the game of sports gambling, and you have your Super Bowls, obviously the championships in every one, and March Madness, definitely a huge gambling uh, time of year for definitely all the sports books in Vegas. And uh, I think something like, kind of like what Jesse said, a lot of people uh, you look at the number, not necessarily where these teams have been throughout the season, a lot of these lower seeds and how they've had success in certain situations. And uh, a lot of people just like to jump on the higher seed and you can get a lot of chances where there's some serious money on them. And I'm not saying it's it's rigged one way or the other, but uh, with a stat like that, definitely going to be, uh, you know, keep fading the public on that one is uh, $100 better being down 2800 bucks. It's a tough look. So uh, definitely just something to keep in mind is, you know, you get into the start of this tournament. I know that's something that we obviously look at going in each and every pick that we gave out, but uh, maybe just something to, to point out for the average sports gambler out there. Yeah, it's not a coincidence that the public loses 99% of the time. Um, Mac, do you think you got enough research for us to get one of those perfect brackets? Yeah, I don't think there's enough research in the world for that one, but... That'd be pretty cool. Never say never, right? Would you rather... You never know. Would you rather hit like a, uh, say, 15-leg parlay for like 20 grand or a uh, perfect bracket? A perfect bracket because you can make so much more money off of that. With like, Your name would be so big. Everyone would want you like on, on their shows and just like on like just talk and stuff. Um, you could just build a brand with that, honestly. All right, let's get a perfect bracket. One of us four. 15-leg parlay is pretty good, too. Yeah, for like 20 grand. Could you imagine the last leg? It's like an OT winner in hockey. Oh. 
I'd go nuts. That'd be crazy. That's the that's the dream. I mean, that's what we're here for. We'll get we'll get there one day. Don't worry. Yeah, you see all these videos and pictures of fucking group chats going nuts. We're out here grinding, giving away three picks, 13 units in this college basketball. We took a dip there. We were up around 25, took a dip there. But March Madness, that's what we're here for. 13 units in college basketball, 12 units in the NBA. Uh, I mean, you know, just a just couple, you know, light 25 units just on the just on the hardwood between the two. Yeah, and not to mention, Huff, uh, I mean... We had so much success in the uh, NFL playoffs. I'm eager to see the NBA playoffs, NHL playoffs come along. And like you guys said, this March Madness, I really think we're going to be hot here. So definitely tap in. And who knows, maybe uh, tell some of our picks, throw them into your group chats, like the one Des Bryant got thrown into. And maybe you can uh, get one of those 15 leggers going. I don't know if I'm letting Des Bryant in our group chat. I don't know about you guys. Mackie, that'd be your call. I mean... Mackie, that's yeah. your call. You're the cowboy. Do you want Des Bryant? We can try to get him. As a cowboy legend, yeah, you have to, but I don't want any minus two, 290 money line. Yeah, I was going to say, he throws it. The first play he threw it was me. like minus 400. Give me a minus 140, minus 150 max, and uh, yeah, you're all welcome. 100%. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. I mean, you, we'll could, you, could tell, you could tell right there that Des Bryant does not do a lot of gambling. But yeah, uh, you know, cool, someone's cool. telling him what the, what to say. Yeah, he's like, oh, I think this team's gonna win eight point favorites. Like, yeah, he yeah, took Pitt again. I, I uh, think they're gonna was win it? too. <laughs> what? It was Pitt money line in the first round. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was there were seven and a half point favorites, and he said Pitt money line. I was like, come on. Man. Yeah, yeah. Pitt, yeah. I mean, I guess win. Yeah, I guess it's an eleven leg parlay or whatever those guys were doing. Looks like we got to get some of the fans involved. Maybe do a hit the books fan, you know, parlay, something along those sorts. Just an idea. I mean, that's not a bad idea. Or we see if what we can do with a four legger. That's right. More realistic than yeah. a ten legger. Let's keep on our track of March Madness. I got another trend here. After a team pulls off a double digit point spread upset in the NCAA tournament, they are just three and seventeen straight up. And 5 and 15 against the spread in their next round, dating back to 2005. So, possibly some of these first round uh, games that might be double digit spreads, these first uh, the first seeds against some of these 16 seeds. There's a lot, there's a lot of double digit spreads just on Thursday. Obviously, the two one seeds, you're going to have Kansas and Alabama as a 23 and a 22 and a half point favorite. Um, Thursday night, you got Arizona at minus 13 and a half. There's double-digit spreads all over the board on Thursday. So um, basically saying if any of those teams, I mean, it's it's likely we're going to see some crazy upsets. And so obviously it's March Madness. They call it that for a reason. Um, but obviously when these teams do end up kind of pulling off a crazy upset as a double-digit dog, it's kind of saying maybe stay away the next game because a lot of the times they mostly come back to earth and get their ass kicked. But um it's always fun to root for the, you know, the Cinderella story. We had St. Peter's and last year, I think they kind of fucked up some of these stats, but, um, you know, you had your, uh, Florida Gulf coast to all the way back. If you look way back in the world of college basketball, like 10, 10 some years Loyola, ago, Chicago. But, yeah. Loyola that one year, Florida Gulf coast last year, St. Peter's, we've had these teams that, you know, they prove it wrong, but most of the time those teams that pull off the upset in the round one, they usually, uh, like I said, come back to earth and get their ass kicked. Yeah, because if you think about it in the long run, you see these type of games, you you see these type of upsets like in the regular season all the time. It's just happening in March, so I guess it looks a lot better when it's in the tournament, but it's really just another game that the better team just blew. Um, so people just get just over-exaggerated a little. Yeah, with the single elimination tournament style, I mean, that's the way that every game means so much. And we see these teams that can rally around something, get hot, um or just have some type of game that will be able to push them over the top. Either it's a clutch player or a team, or if it's Loyola Chicago, they had uh, the sister Jean, I believe her name is. So yeah. if you have somebody that can go viral, Dougie Dirt, sister Jean, um, Dunk City, something like that. Yeah, Dunk City. That was yeah. Florida Gulf yep. Coast. Yep. I mean, there's teams that can do it, and we see people do it all the time. It's just picking out who that one's going to be. Uh, I know Mackie has some thoughts on it. I'm eager to dive into it. I did my 8x8 the other day, and 
he was feeding me some picks down the line when I got to 13 through 16, so. Yeah, I definitely have a few, few uh, 14, 15, 13 seeds. Definitely no 16 seeds, but 13, 14, 15 seeds that I uh, definitely have my eye on. No one seeds are going out this year. Don't see it. Mackie, don't speak it into existence. Those dark horses can arise very quickly. I just don't see it happening. Yeah, these would be these Purdue. Ones, he's legit. Purdue. Purdue. Yeah, I was going to say Purdue would be the only one that I would say Purdue, is a chance. Of Purdue only because they're so easily beaten by a trap just because they work through ED so so aggressively. Um, if a team gets hot against that and is able to, it's just working, it's possible. But, I mean, Purdue still, he's still 7 4 at the end of the day. Yeah, I was going to say he can put up 40. But if you have, if they have a guy who matches up decently against him, it's possible. Yeah. You're just not going to see a 16 seat with a guy that's seven foot tall uh, down the line. I don't think so. And Mackie, by the way, the game that you're watching, the winner of that gets Purdue. Kansas has. Oh, I know. Um, yeah, Kansas has Howard. That's locked in tomorrow at 2 p.m. This Texas Southern team does have some big guys down low, too. But, um,. They're, it doesn't even look like they're going to win. But here, next up in March Madness, I have that the Houston Cougars are the favorite to win the national championship this year at plus 500. Currently, they were plus 600 before the bracket was released. Since seeding began back in 1978, only three other betting favorites have entered March Madness with odds higher than plus 500. 2017-2018 Villanova Wildcats who won the national championship 2016-2017 UNC Tar Heels also won the national championship and the 1995-96 Tar Heels lost in the round of 32. How do we uh, see Houston faring this year in the tournament? See them going far? Mackie, I know you said no number one seeds you know, are going out this year. What, what do we think? Why don't you start us off? I just don't understand how this team is still looked at as the favorite to win it. I mean, you play in the AAC the entire season. Your your hardest team you play the entire season is Memphis. Um, and then you just come into a tournament against powerhouses in the Pac-12 at like Kansas, uh, Texas, Baylor even, and you're going to you're gonna take this team over teams that have been playing the hardest competition the entire season. Uh, I expect they didn't even win their conference tournament. They lost. Memphis beat them. Um, I, I, I don't understand. I don't see the hype around this team. I think they're good – they're a dominant enough team to get through the easily the first round, maybe even the second round. But once they play with once they play with like a powerhouse Pac-12 team, SEC team, um, they're they're not beating them. I don't think they're. I really don't even think they're that good. They're they're a one seed, but we've seen better one seeds. Um, I just don't understand with them being a betting favorite at plus five hundred, especially after the brackets came out, like it's gone up or it's gone down. I I guess. Um, doesn't really make sense to me. I don't know what you guys think. I mean, I, I I know you've been you've had different opinions on this Houston team than I did. I I mean, they I didn't really like them in that as much as I did in the spot against Cincinnati in that uh, AAC championship against Memphis. Obviously, Memphis plays a kind of a different game than uh, that Cincinnati team. And Memphis, obviously, like you said, went on to win their uh, tournament. Houston, obviously, like you said, how far do I have them going? In one of my main, more main brackets, I definitely have them at least reaching the Sweet 16. Uh, I think if Miami can get to the out of the round of 32 or against out of the round of 64 against Drake, I think that's the only legitimate matchup that Houston will have trouble with uh, leading up in into the Sweet 16. But I don't know. I I, I think this Houston team. I think obviously you're going to have a lot of people that are picking them, but. I think they're they're definitely a legitimate team, and I think uh, with the the national championship being in Houston, Jim Nance is la- it's his last Final Four. He's fr- he went to Houston. That's his alma mater. There's like a whole thing around that. Uh, I'm thinking Houston could go on a little run here. So um, I at least have them reaching the Sweet 16. Like I said, I think Miami. If Miami gets out of the round of 64. I think that Houston Miami game in the Sweet 16 is their first legitimate matchup, and then uh, obviously if they win that game, I have them playing Texas. So, um, but it'll it'll be interesting to see. Obviously, them being a one seed, like I said, a lot of people are gonna be picking them. So to see how far they go, it'll be interesting.
All right, and I got one last trend here. Since 2012, number five seeds are 21 and 19 straight up versus number 12 seeds. And they are 15, 24, and one against the spread in those opening round matchups. In the last three March Madness tournaments, number five seeds are six and six straight up and four and eight against the spread. What number five seeds could you see being on upset watch this tournament? Yeah, I feel like everyone always knows about the 5-12 games. Um, t- the five seeds are usually the most upset in in out of every um, out of every seed in the bracket. But this, I mean, the 5-12 is this. Uh, the, the thing about this this one five twelve game is uh, Duke Oral Roberts is that Oral Roberts was that one team before the bracket came out that everyone was like, watch out for this team um, and who their matchup against. They could they could definitely be an upset. And then they, they get yell Duke. Duke, and everyone has Duke. And they get Duke, and everyone has Duke in the Final Four, including me, to be honest. I'm not even going to lie. But I, I, I'm i scared to take this team to my Final Four because of the upset watch on Week 1. I really think they can lose this game Week 1. I think it's their hardest their hardest game to get to the at least the Elite, elite 8. Um, this could be a tough one. Um, what are some other five seeds? Huff, do you, do you, have you looked into any other five seeds? Yeah, my favorite my favorite twelve seed that I'm gonna probably be taking, probably more with the points than the money line is VCU over St. Mary's. I like I, I watched VCU in their uh conference tournament last week and I mean just off recency bias, that's a team that I think I don't really want to bet against anymore. And um I know St. Mary's has the skill that they've had, but playing in I don't even know what that conference is out there that them and Gonzaga play in. I literally forget what W C C Yeah, the W C C but West Coast. Um, I don't conference. know. I like I like for I like VCU in this matchup. They're known to be a March Madness team and uh, come to play in March. I, I'm I like VCU. That's my favorite 12 seed. That's a yeah. I'm I'm with you on VCU as well. I'm also not a big guy on St. Mary's. I think they're a little overrated. And Gonzaga manhandled them in the um in a WCC championship game. But um yeah, that's another team. I also kind of. I like Miami, but I do kind of like Drake, and the line's only sitting at one and a half right now, so I'm assuming the public is going to be hammering Miami at minus one and a half. Um, definitely a game to look out for, but I do like that Miami team. I can see them going far, so not I, one that I, I'll be taking. That's a but game I almost don't even want to bet because I'm, I have the same exact opinion as you. I know how good Miami is, and if I take Drake and Miami blows them out, I'm going to be so mad at myself. I'm not betting it exactly, yeah. But I'm scared to take him far in my bracket for that reason. Same thing with Duke. Um, just two five seeds that that can definitely get upset in the first round. Mac, you don't have any opinion about the other one? Who's your? Isn't Charleston the other one? Wasn't it you that was telling me you like that game? Charles, uh, what was that? Charleston, San Diego State. Yeah, I do have Charleston against San Diego State as well. I actually genuinely think that all 12 seeds can win this year. I I think it's an actual possibility. Um, The two that I actually alluded to, I'm not taking. I actually am taking Charleston and VCU. But um, I just don't like San Diego State at all. And coming coming out of that, um, I think they're in the West Coast Conference too. Uh, Yeah, 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 they are. No, what are they? No, Mountain West. They're Mountain Mountain West. West. They're Mountain West. West. I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that conference, and they're known for being one and dones every single year. Uh, Utah State is also in this tournament from the Mountain West. They're a 10 seed playing Missouri. Um, just teams to look out for. The Mountain West is terrible in um, in, Mar- in March Madness. Uh, Charleston's also a team that I think can definitely get to the Sweet 16 because I I also have um, I have Furman beating Virginia, thir- 13 versus four matchup. So I have uh, Charleston and Furman in my second round. And I think Charleston will, will be will um will take that one, and then they'll have to play probably Alabama. So I, I have I have their road ending there, but I do like this Charleston team, and they started off really good. I think they were like twenty and one to start the season. Um, just another team to look out for. Yeah, um, I'm trying to like look around. Yeah, they're, they're, like big they're thirty-one and three. They this teams that don't lose often. I mean, don't don't take it away from them. I mean, they don't. They know how to win games. They know how to get the job done. So, close games down the road in March. Yeah. Um, that War Roberts team. I've heard a lot about them. Uh, from a lot of like different websites and whatnot. Uh, can you give a little bit more of an explanation on why they might be a good seed to look at? And why a lot of people? I know they have Duke in the first round, but why are they uh, an appetizing team for a lower seed?
Yeah, so um, that Oral Roberts team, and, and you know they made a, few, a, a run two years ago, I think. They still have that point guard. I'm not even sure what his name is, to be honest, but he's been going off this year. He's one. He's, I think he won the uh, Conference Player of the Year. Um, so they're and they're they're thirty and four. They've won seventeen games in a row. So they're blowing out the competition. Um, they're just on a roll. It's a team that knows how to win. Another team that knows how to win. So that's the only real real stuff I know about them. I'm not really big in um, mid conference teams, but it's just a team that's that that's uh, dominated the competition at their level. So coming into the tournament, they were definitely a team to watch, especially sitting at thirty and four in a seventeen game win streak. Yeah, that, that that makes sense, especially with their record and whatnot. I think one t- thing I'd like to look at with some of these lower seeds um, that I'm not too familiar with, is there any, like, top players for these bottom teams that could really put on a show as, like, a to make an all-tournament team playing on a lower-than-10-seed team? Like a John Moran or something like that? Yeah, um, not that I know of. There definitely can be. I can... Um, I, I'm not really, like I said, I'm not, I haven't, I don't really bet on these teams throughout the season. I usually just stay with the power conferences, um, just the teams that I know more about, but, um, not that I know of what, what do you say off? I know obviously one guy that for a reason that I think a couple of people have Penn State going pretty far is Jalen Pickett on Penn State. That's one reason, at least for uh, a couple guys that I know from the lower seeds. And then a uh, reason I like that, uh, VCU team is, I think his name is, Ace, Ace Baldwin, actually. Ace, there you go. There's a guy you can remember his name pretty easily. Uh, Ace Baldwin for VCU. He was a, kind of a pretty good player for them, at least in that tournament when I was watching them last week. And then um, a team that I like, Mackie, I think you said you have NC State losing in the first round. Who are they play? Creighton. Yeah, I have Creighton going pretty far. Yeah, see, I have NC State there. I like uh, I like a lot of the guys on NC State's team, so that's another little I was, team that I know. I was big on NC State throughout the year, too, but they've just kind of been blowing me, and I took them against Clemson a few games ago, and they got blown out by, like, 40. And since then, I just can't look at that team the same. And I also, I really like Creighton. I think they're a pretty big powerhouse coming out of the Big East. <laughs> but I, I see your logic at NC State. I mean... They're a team that I rode a lot in the beginning of the season. Yeah, I have NC State. I have NC State in that game. I think I don't know how far. I gotta pull my bracket up, see how far I have them going. But um, they play. I have them playing Baylor in the next round, losing. Alrighty, good stuff out of March Madness. Lots to look forward to as that is quickly approaching. Games starting here on Thursday. But with that, let's jump into what we got in the NHL, cooking up this week in the NHL. First point I got here is Jonathan Quick's hot start with his new team, going 4-0 in his first four games with Vegas. He's undefeated with a .930 save percentage and a shutout in those one of those four games. What do you guys think about this? Pretty impressive by the boy coming into, uh, into Vegas after being traded from the Kings to Columbus, then to Vegas. What do we think, boys? Isn't he Ace? Didn't you say his uh he's like three and zero since he's been there? Four and zero, four and zero. He just won again last night. Good for him, dude. I mean, I haven't really watched any of his games. I don't know if you guys have, but um, I mean, I'm just happy he's not in Columbus. I'm sure he is too, making a playoff push and maybe a playoff run. Yeah, I'm just I'm just happy to see him being playing meaningful hockey still. I mean, he still has the talent and the uh, pedigree that he's had his whole career. Now he's playing behind. One of the best teams in the league, the best team in the West, and he's showing out like just said with a nine thirty save percentage. I mean, yeah, he's four and zero with a great team, but nine thirty save percentage, Mackie, as you know, that's pretty high. So, like we've talked about before on this podcast, if they have to turn him in the playoffs or if they ride his hot hand, um, I'm eager to see if he can put on a show and get those Vegas Golden Knights to the promise line like they've sought to do. Yeah, it's not my quite not quite my numbers, but um, they're, they're pretty good. Alrighty, next point here I got in the NHL is that the Bruins are officially the first team to clinch a spot in the 2023 NHL playoffs while also being the fastest team to 50 wins. Lots of good stuff there for the Bruins. Ace, what do you think about the Bruins? Looking good this year, like we keep talking about each and every week. I think they're great. I mean, they're the Boston Bruins. I've said it since before the season started, and I'm going to say it now. Best Bruins team I've seen in my life. 
hopefully they can get the job done because we know the playoffs are a whole new beast. But uh, a little low right now, but they'll be good. Get healthy. Get Hall back. Like I was telling Mackie, use the Kucherov rule on the IR and uh, be uncap compliant. Going into the playoffs and then figure it out. Get the full lineup and roll teams like we should. Better in presence and also Look to get back on track, but nice to see those records being break in. Nice to have that asterisk next to your name when looking at the standings. Roll those penguins in the first round. Yeah. Feed me the dinosaurs. Huff. <laughs> the dinosaurs. You got to pair cool dinosaurs thing. yourself. Yeah, but we're like the elite dinosaurs. Huff's like one of those, uh, what is it, brontosaurus. We got like T-Rexes, pterodactyls flying around. Cool. <laughs> it's all talk until the President's Cup trophy winners lose in the first round. Yeah. Well, the thing is, Hubs dinosaurs are good too, but when you think about it, they just don't have anybody playing goaltender, and that's pretty important. We have the best, but they have nobody, so I don't really know what's set. You tell me. Yeah, not not gonna lie, bro. Like watching Penguins recently, Jari's a plug. You guys need you guys need to do something about that. That's the only thing you guys need. Yeah, well, good thing the trade deadline was a couple of weeks ago, right? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to bash your fans like that, but... Yeah, Jonathan Quick went for the cheap. You guys missed out there. Imagine you guys got Quick. I don't know. If, uh, Come I, on. Uh, right now, you wouldn't want him over Jari? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would, but I don't know. I'm not confident in really Jari. I haven't been confident in Jari all season. Huff doesn't think like Huff thing. Huff doesn't think the team needs a goaltender to get over the hump. I think he's trying to hint that the Pens aren't going to make much noise in this year's postseason if they get there. I think if you have a goaltender, it's obviously a different opinion. But I just know what we're working with in in net. Jari gives up fucking four. His last two two out of three starts, he's at up four in the first period. You guys like give you up do, and again, that's against or... that's against Columbus and Montreal. You do if you we, say we do get the Bruins, that's that's six seven goals in the first period. Like if you even let it get that bad with Jari, yeah. Well, the thing is, would they want to give up some assets or like a pick for one year of quick? Would that put them over the top? I don't think so. It may win them around or keep them a little bit more relevant. But I think they got to hold on to those assets and plan for the future a bit. What about DeSmith? I'm more right confident. Now. I'm way more confident in DeSmith right now than I am Jari. Didn't he play? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see how. Yeah. Well, that's just because Jari was hurt. But he did play it's, well. And fucking that. Rangers also. Louis Domingue had to play too. That was insane. Yeah. And you took those. You took that fake Good team out of New York to seven. Good times. Is that game seven game? Ah, uh, that was that was electric. Being in the guard. Pens have the lead in that game. Nothing like it. Yeah. Dude, they're up going into the third. They hit the but you know, she's circling out the best of them. So yeah. Okay. You really want to get me going about that series, dude? <laughs> <laughs> Pop, just, just, so so Jory, Pop, just just hide behind the rings. Dude, I don't need to hide this behind you up in the rafters, dude. Yeah, Man, know, hang him. know what that's like. Back to back. Matt, Matt was the remit of that in every sport. No, I don't I don't You're like right. to play that card because that's starting to get a little bit, bit ways away. That's like five, six years ago now. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. If back to back, though. You could sure. definitely flex that for a little while. Yeah, it's starting to come to the tail end of being able to flex that. You have arguably the best hockey player as well of all time. Of all time? Yeah. I don't know. Crosby, I think Wayne Gretzky in, holds that title. Yeah. Long no, the, yeah. No, no. I'm not saying like the go or the best of all time, but I'm saying skill wise behind McDavid, I'd go Crosby as my second most skilled player in NHL history. Would, yeah. And the, the fact that he's like still doing it right now. No, but if he's you think about slower, it, a lot slower now. But he's a game changer. Like Wayne Gretzky changed the game that came after him. Crosby made it to what McDavid could be, and McDavid's going to make it to what the next guy can be. I was going to say, then the next yeah, guy's going to come right in, and imagine what the next guy's going to look like. 
Yep. Some well, four year old out there is gonna be the next next kid we're talking about every night on a night in and night out basis saying this dude better <laughs> fucking score. I got puck line. I think uh I think um we're gonna get to this point earlier or later. I think Jesse has it down for sure, but Mackie, that, that boy Connor McDavid, he's still rolling onto that MVP race, huh? Yeah, but dude, it's like he's he's still putting up two points a night, but it feels like he's slowing down right now. Uh they got like fourteen games left. I think he needs twenty one points. So he's in he's in good shape to do it still, but um I really want him to get one fifty so bad. I think you will. You know, he on pace Connor for McDavid. Twenty one I mean, points in twenty one games. games. He can get twenty one points in eight games, it, but yeah, uh, yeah. Let's see if he does it. It's gonna be exciting to watch. Uh he's we'll definitely see, that's gonna be an interesting one to track. They've climbed into the uh, out of the wild card spot as well and jumped into that central standing. Yeah, I said that's one that we whenever we did dove into the wild card spots a couple of weeks ago. That was one I said I think they'll pass up Seattle. Yeah, but over in the West, I feel like getting into that uh, third spot isn't that big of a deal. I mean, in the East, you got to play Boston or Carolina. It's looking like over there you play who Dallas or Dallas or Vegas. Vegas. I'd, wanna, I'd want to avoid those two teams if I could. I'd I'd rather avoid the Avs. No, if the way it sits right now, the um, Oilers were to get the uh, would they get the Wild in the first round? I believe. Yeah. No, the they'd get the Jets. Kings. Oh, the Kings are there too. Not yeah. them wild, Wild Kings, Jets. Any of those teams, I'd much rather see. Avalanche bring up a good point, but I don't want to see the Stars the nice going in the playoffs, especially when in their house. Um, we know Vegas gets rocking, but. It's only separated by a game or two out there. Yeah, lots to look forward to as we get closer to the NHL playoffs here. Big race in the East and somewhat of a race coming up here in the West, I think. So let's move on to this next point that I got. John Gibson set a franchise record for the Anaheim Ducks with his thir- his 13th save the other night. Guy Hebert set Anaheim's club record for all-time saves at 11,814. An impressive feat there for John Gibson. Uh, Anaheim Duck there. Lots of good stuff there. Anybody have a comment? Pittsburgh guy, shout out Johnny Gibson. Yeah, I was going to say that. I didn't know it was Pittsburgh, Huff, but American goaltender, love to see it. Um, Kudos to him, especially on a bad team, still sticking with his franchise and doing what he does best, stopping bucks. Good stuff. And next up, I have that the NHL has set a new record by having the most multi-goal third-period comebacks in a given season. As the New York Islanders became the 50th team to come storming back to complete the feat in their win over the Penguins just a few days ago. That was the 50th. I think there might have been another one the other day as well. And now that you bring it up, it it makes sense. I mean, it th- this year's been entertaining in the NHL. I don't know about you guys and a lot of us as gamblers and sports bettors and whatnot, it's been pretty crazy some of the times a team you're betting on has come back or a huge deficit. I know Huff, your pens have been doing it year in, year long. Uh, they blew one the other day, but a lot of multiple comebacks makes for good hockey. I attribute that to the, the, the talent and depth of scoring in the NHL. That's just what That's it like comes remember. down to. It's how good the league is right now. It's just remember so easy. last year? These, these guys... Remember last year how often Florida was doing that? Like, it was like Florida went down by three. It was like, okay, I bet Florida money line. Like, I feel like, and even this year it's happening, like, I mean, clearly at an all-time high. Like, I feel like these games I've seen 3-1. You're like, oh, yeah, this is getting out of hand. It's third period, 3-1, 15 minutes left. Next thing you know, 3-2. And next thing you know, you're going to overtime 3-3. And um, you most of the time the team with the momentum is going to take care of it in overtime. But... Um, yeah, it just sucks to see my Penguins give up the, the 50th one, but fuck those Islanders. They're hanging around. I said the Penguins are good. Penguins and Islanders are going to be those bubble teams, and they're starting to, Penguins are at least starting to separate themselves from the, the rest of the pack other than the Islanders, but, um, yeah, it's looking like they're going to stay true there. Mackie, I was, I know we had the Penguins and Rangers, uh, Bruins parlay again last night, but, uh, I was low-key, if one of the legs was going to lose, I was kind of rooting for the Rangers, so we had a chance to go into these games on, uh, Thursday and Saturday, maybe with a chance of us getting pretty close to you guys in the point race, but uh, us still sitting with 78, you guys sitting at 86, still a little bit of ways away, but um, yeah, we definitely have some important games coming up, too, against the Rangers. Those are going to be huge games. See 
uh, kind of playoff, playoff style hockey, like you said, and see what this team's capable of. But, um, yeah, coming down the stretch, I'm excited. Yeah, uh, um, games. That, that that was huge last night uh, with the Rangers winning and the Penguins losing. You were obviously hoping it went the opposite way, but yeah, these two big these two games coming up are huge, and you guys obviously just stole that one at home. We got a point out of it though, which is pretty big. You guys just need to at least get these games to overtime, get a point or two out of out of this uh, these two games at the Garden. Yeah, if we imagine a sweep, sweep, a sweep here. Imagine be, if we nice. sweep, uh, you're done. If if we sweep, you're done. Well, if the Penguins sweep, you you're sitting at like if you guys if we sweep you, you're, you're sitting at twelve points with what twelve games left. I mean twelve points. Like you guys couldn't catch us. You guys couldn't catch us. Is what I'm oh yeah 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 yeah. You sweep them, hockey, but uh, I mean, I mean, if you guys can get even three points out of this, um, that'll be huge for you guys. Yeah, if we win one, take one overtime, that's like a great trip. That's what you need, though. Yeah. And, and I mean, you're going into Madison Square Garden, and it's not going to be easy. But um, we we've seen how the Rangers have struggled with the Penguins. Hoping, the past, hoping so. Shesterkin doesn't play both of them. That'd be nice. He's well, going to play know, Saturday. I don't think he'll play both. I, I right? Could... They're back to back. Oh, they're not back to back. Fuck. They're not though. They're, there's a day in between. No. But there's a game on Sunday, so I don't think he's going to play Ooh. Saturday. I think he'll just play Thursday. Interesting thought. I don't know though. They play Halak a lot. Yeah, but one thing I would yeah. say, it's gonna be going into this weekend, going into this weekend, two bets I'd look at for that series. I mean, you're going to have to look for the Hawk game. Definitely take the over that night because we know the Penguins like to score and can't stop a lot of people. And the Hawk's very leaky on the back end. But on the other night against Shesterkin, I'm going to be looking at those Pens money line. I know we won't card it because Mackey would definitely be against it. But as an outside better, there's some value on that. And it's a, such a huge game for the Penguins who have been there in this moment before and been successful. Um, I'd like to see him on the road come out and win. Jerry to rebound. Actually, a decent goaltender just playing bad as of late. And the Rangers aren't really an offensive team either, so it kind of checks out for the Penguins. Um, I mean, the, I, it matters with the line sitting out. If you, got, if you get the Penguins at like plus 150, 160, which I probably think you will at, at least one of the games, um, yeah, I mean, obviously I don't see a problem. I don't see why you wouldn't take that. But obviously I'm not going to take it being a Rangers fan. Both games so far this year between the Penguins and Rangers have been a 3-2 final score. Really? I feel like they're always unders, dude. Even in, like, the playoff series, other than when Shister can get lit up. Imagine taking that yeah. correct score. Hey, Mackie. Yeah, 3-2 Rangers would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> Mackie, What's up, Ace? As your team is getting into the upper echelon with my Bruins and the likes of a few others in the East, um, do you really think that the Penguins pose a threat coming down the stretch? Is that a team you're afraid of? Um, personally, yes. As a for the Rangers, uh, we just don't really match up well against them. What I don't. I don't really about? ever feel really the the Penguins. I think. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Person, like, as a Rangers fan, I do, but I don't think we. I don't, there's no real scenario where we're gonna have to play the Penguins, um, unless we both get past the first round. But um, coming in, coming into it like against the Bruins, if you guys have to play them in the first round, uh, I don't see a problem there, just because again, like Jari, the, the offensive power that the Bruins have, and then you have Jari in net with the the zero confidence that he has. Maybe if he could figure it out by then, but um, I just think you guys would tear him apart. It'd be a four game four game series. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. Um, I'm not too worried about them, and I don't think the Rangers should be either. Maybe this weekend I would be, but if it came to to it in the playoffs, I think the Rangers would handle business. Um, I know we talk about this a lot week in and week out, but it's so interesting to me, especially as a hockey fan and the season coming down to the wire now. What teams do you think in the wild card race do pose a threat to these top seeds? I know who I have on the top of my mind, but I'm going to hear who you guys think really could be a threat to get to that second round of the playoffs if they do squeak into the wild card. Are the Oilers in that three spot right now, or are they considered a wild card team? They're uh, they're uh, they're a three spot. I was I was talking more Jess. right now, but you can go with the what? Oh, uh, East. Well, the only other teams you're really talking about here are the Islanders, Panthers, and I guess Sabers. 
The uh, Senators and Red Wings are still there. I don't know. I think the Penguins I, I think the Penguins are the best team out of the out of the wild card teams. I think they pose the most threat. I just think that the East is too good at the top. I don't think a wild card team can come out of it. I don't I I still think that the talent on the Panthers is scared. And now the goal scoring by the Sabres too, but a lot of people that I'm seeing everywhere is the Islanders. Everybody's so keen on those uh, Islanders, but I just don't think they have enough skill to hang with those top dogs. They just play such a boring game with a defensive style. They try to get it to like a 3-2, 3-1 final score. And I mean, when you got Sorokin in net and he's on, he's shown that he's can he can hang in those games. Yeah, you're not wrong. I, I personally think that I really think the Islanders are going to fall out of that spot. I don't think they're going to get to that. Uh, I, mean, out there. I, don't, I don't think they're as good as these other teams that are vying for that final spot. I'm sick. Sabres are my fun one to see. Just pick. Yeah, well, I forget what I said. I I'm I think I'm definitely different than what I said before. I think I said Panthers, Penguins. I said Panthers, Isles. I think I said Panthers, Penguins, but I, yeah, maybe I'm sticking with it. I don't know. I like the Sabres. I really want to see the Sabres make it. They're also up three one right now in the Caps. Yeah, they have that firepower, and that's how that's how you can hang around. The Sabres will get ball. humped by the Bruins in the first round, though. Oh, I'd love to see that. Just, just the, uh, especially the inexperience getting the playoffs. Like that's just. Yeah, their goalies are weak too. But that'll be interesting. I follow down the stretch. I know uh, we'll all of our eyes on that as March Madness gets through and then on to the NHL season. Alrighty, let's get to this next point in the NHL. Patrick Kane, after joining the New York Rangers, has now reached the 50-point mark in a season for the 16th time in his career, passing Mike Modano for the most by a U.S.-born player. Does this make him, you know, one of the best, if not the best player, U.S.-born player, rather? What do we think about this one? It's tough to say this. Uh, myself, because I was such a big Mike Madonna fan growing up. I, that was the first jersey I think I ever bought for a hockey jersey at the NHL store in New York City. But um, yeah, Patrick Keane, most skilled American of all time. So definitely the best player of all time born in the United States. And he molded the game so much, like we were saying with Crosby earlier and McDavid paving the way for the youth. McDa- or Kane really helped the Americans see that they too can be skilled guys. And I see people like Jack Hughes coming into the league. So his legacy will be on forever. Best 88, in my opinion. I know Lindros is there, but I wonder what you guys think. Definitely, in my opinion, best American board player. Yeah, I was I was never too big. I was never too big of a Blackhawks fan growing up. Obviously, that's kind of like Penguins won their cup in 09, and then that Blackhawks dynasty caught fire. And then when the Penguins got there too in 16 and 17, I kind of was more okay. We're at the same level of these guys, the three cups and, uh, you know, your core years and. Obviously, Kane and Taves, what they were able to do with that Chicago Blackhawks team over that, like, five-year stretch when they won those three cups. And it was kind of the Kings versus Blackhawks out west, and that was kind of a sick time in the NHL when Patrick Kane was scoring that OT winner and when he scored the OT winner in the cup against the Flyers. And he's definitely had all the crazy moments and uh, definitely the best U.S.-born player. Obviously, like we said, Madonna, a legend. Uh, It's going to be interesting to see what Austin Matthews can do and – uh, we always say, like, you know, the next wave, you said Jack Hughes, the Hughes brothers, those kinds of guys, what they're going to be able to do. But Kane, three cups, uh, the consistency over his whole career, and now uh, going to go and chase one with the Rangers. It's going to be interesting to see what comes down to uh, come, like I said, April and May. All righty, that's going to wrap up everything we have in the NHL. Let's shift our brain or let's shift over to the NFL. We got lots of free agency news and trade talk to to cover. So let's jump into some of these trades that are going on. The first one I have here is that the Chicago Bears have traded the first overall pick in the 2023 NHL NFL draft to the Carolina Panthers for wide receiver DJ Moore and four draft picks. What do we think the Panthers are going to do with these picks or with this pick um, that they received here for DJ Moore and some some picks? What do you guys think? I've heard CJ Stroud a lot. I've heard um, Panthers had a really good talk with him. And I don't know. Though. I don't think he should go first overall. I don't I don't think he should go first overall. 
Oh, this no. is a lot of stuff yeah, about Anthony here. Richardson, and, which is crazy because you could get him at like ten. They didn't need to trade. I don't know why they traded. Off That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, like and they gave up so they much to solidify it, but slots. especially with like this year's talent, I know that they're every year they need a young quarterback. But I don't think these are game breakers like Lawrence and Barrow. Where like they could have success in the NFL, but I don't know. They, they gave up too much. The Bears, great move by them. And they've had a great offseason, which we're going to get into. Just a team on the rise in the NFC North. I'm excited that Justin Fields gets a real weapon with DJ Moore. And he gets a ton of assets as well. So, um, Chicago Bears, kudos to you. Their Carolina Panthers, you overpaid. Better hit on this draft pick. Yeah, this this is an absolute great move by the Bears. I mean, obviously, everyone's kind of saying that. And this Bears team is definitely one to watch. And one I'm going to be rooting for coming in the next year. Obviously, I really like what they've been doing throughout the offseason. And, they move back at four picks and a great wide receiver in return for it. Ace, like you said, Justin Fields finally has kind of a legitimate weapon to work with at the wide receiver position. Um, we know it's uh, they did lose David Montgomery. We'll get into that. But obviously they got draft picks everywhere and uh, signing guys all over the defensive side of the ball. So definitely a team on the rise, like you said, in the AFC Nor- or in the NFC North. Looking forward to see how the Bears do this season. Let's jump on to our next point here. The Los Angeles Rams have traded cornerback Jalen Ramsey to the Miami Dolphins in exchange for a 2023 third-round pick and tight end Hunter Long. Can a veteran leader in Jalen Ramsey help this young Dolphins team get over the hump? What do we think? I really like this move for the Dolphins. I think this is kind of their version of going all in and getting guys all over the field, and they're kind of addressing the issues. They go out, they have Xavier and Howard. They wanted to get a guy for the other side of the field. Who better to get than a veteran and Jalen Ramsey? I know we've all aired our grievances about Ramsey and how he could be washed at times and overhyped at times, but still one of the better corners in the NFL. Definitely not one of the guys you want to go up against on any given Sunday. So I like this move for the Dolphins. I definitely don't think they overpaid for it. A third-round pick and a tight end I've never heard of, so – uh, I do like Jalen Ramsey to the Dolphins. I think that's a great move for Miami. Yeah, I I really like this Miami team now. I think they just need to go out and get one more. Uh, I saw somebody tweeted. I'm not going to take credit for it, but um, somebody said you have Jalen Ramsey and Xavier Howard on one side of the ball, and then you have Terry Hill and Jalen Waddle on the other. Um, that's that's pretty hard to match on both sides of the ball. So they, they go out there, and I don't really trust Tua. I think he's already got CTE, so. Go out and get Lamar, and this team is stacked. What do you mean go get Lamar? They just got Mike White. Yeah, they're going to start Mike that White. Too no, they're going to roll with Tua Tagovailoa. He's going to start, and they have a valid oh, back they, emotion. Yeah, Mike White's on a starting quarterback. No, but he's a solid option to come in if Tua goes down with an injury. Oh, dude, I don't know. They need a figure. They need a... F- I don't know. I I I I. I I hate. Oh, I thought that. Lot. I thought that was just like dishing off a quarterback. I really thought that that was just dishing off a quarterback. Maybe be a second option at all times. I think. I think Tua Tagovailoa. He's he's not that bad. I've criticized him a lot, but he's actually pretty solid. And when he's in, they win football games. Um, his numbers don't lie. He was dude. He has CTE. High. Yeah, but he's gonna play. <laughs> I I don't think he plays like four or five more years in the league. I I really don't. Yeah, but they're more worried about the right now with this, especially the signing with Jalen Ramsey. So we we have to think he's going to be on the field. All signs are pointing to that. So I think they roll with him. But back to my point about this move, I, I like Jalen Ramsey going to that defense. The one move that was pretty uh, underrated that we didn't touch on too much was Bradley Chubb going to the Miami Dolphins. So with Chubb and Ramsey now on that side of the ball with the pieces they already have in that offense, how good it is. I said they were going to make the playoffs last year before the season. People doubted it. They got in. I think they're even better this year. It's tough to say as a Patriots fan, but that's a formidable squad that they're forming down there in Miami. Great move with the Ramsey. That scare you a little, Ace. AFC East. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I think they're they're the best team in the division. I think that the Bills are an overrated team, in my opinion. A lot of people like to tell me I'm wrong, but they're losing a lot of core pieces. And... They don't perform when it matters, and they almost lost to Skyler Thompson last year. So, I think this Dolphins team's on the rise while the uh, Bills are on the downfall. Well, 
Well, let's quickly switch tracks here from the Rams over the Chargers. Los Angeles Chargers running back Austin Eckler is requesting permission to speak with other teams about a potential, a potential trade after preliminary talks with the team aimed at a contract extension did not po- progress. His danger, Cameron, Cameron Weiss, told ESPN per Adam Scheffner. So what do we think? Uh, where do we think Eckler's going to end up? Do we think he's going to stay in Los Angeles? Do we think he's going to end up somewhere else? What do you guys think? I think this is a prime example of a team kind of doing the same thing that the Ravens are doing with Lamar Jackson. They're saying, go ahead, go go try to get the money that you think you deserve and you're so willing of. And obviously Austin Eckler, Lamar Jackson, great players in the league. And when these guys think they're worth all this crazy money and some of these leagues kind of just want to set the, set the standard, they're saying, okay, go ahead. You can go talk to these other teams and see if they're going to pay you. We get a chance to match it in certain situations like Lamar. Um I think I think we'll see him back with the Chargers. I don't see a situation where he leaves. I think the contract will work itself out. It's just a matter of if some other team makes a makes some kind of crazy offer to him and the Chargers are just like, we can't match this. Uh, we see it happen all the time with running backs in the NFL. They want to get this crazy money, and we know the standard in the NFL. Usually the teams that are winning don't have these big-name running backs. They usually just have kind of a plug-and-play running back, running back by committee with a great offensive line, great quarterback, and skilled players all over the place, just athletes more than a stud star running back that's making 16 to $20 million a year. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I'm definitely on the same page. I think he's just going to go out there and maybe get an offer and just see if the Chargers are going to match it. I don't, see, I don't really think he's going to go anywhere. I think the Chargers would be dumb to let him go. But at the end of the day, if you can't afford it, I guess you can't afford it. Curious to see where Austin Eckler ends up. Maybe staying with Los Angeles, maybe going somewhere else, depending on what he and his agent figure out. Next up, I got Jonu Smith was sent from New England to Atlanta for a seventh round pick and a cap dump for New England. Pretty interesting one there. Not much else on that one. The next point I got is the Indianapolis Colts are trading five-time fuck, Pro Bowl corner and former Defensive Player of the Year Stephon Gilmore to the Dallas Cowboys in exchange for Dalton Schultz. Mackey, your Cowboys getting rid of Schultz here. You think Gilmore is a step in the right direction? What do you think? Uh, Gilmore is still, still a very good, um, still a very good corner. He's definitely aged a little. Um, I don't really like to see Dalton Schultz go. I think he was a very good piece. Um, Huff, you probably love him more than I do. With I love he's Dalton you. Schultz. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if you're gonna get that in Indianapolis, but it was a nice ride. If he, if you don't, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't mind the move. Um, I guess we got Ferguson at tight end now. See what he can do. So, not much else. Yeah, I was just I thinking think Ferguson. Uh, I think Ferguson all in Indy. Ferguson's not bad. He's de- he's definitely an option. Um, I I like Schultz, dude. Schultz was, you know, what's going to borderline top five nice. tight end in the league. You want to hear something though? Bold prediction. I really do think. Lam- I hope Lamar stays with the Ravens. But when Lamar goes to the Indianapolis Colts, he will have Dalton Schultz. There's a very nice safety valve, like he used Mark Andrews, and that'll be a good tandem in Indianapolis. That would that would be cool. That would work together really really well. I would just. He would just be the new Mark Andrews, like you said. Um, yeah, definitely. That's one of yeah, the things for Lamar Jackson, in my opinion. I like that. The Lamar Jackson news will come. That's going to be big when we get it, but it will be coming. Don't worry, folks. Good stuff there, boys. The next point I got here is tight end Darren Waller traded to the New York Giants from Las Vegas for just a 2023 third rounder. What do we think about the value here? I love this move for the Giants. They went out and got a a definite playmaker in Darren Waller, a guy that Daniel Jones could have as a security blanket. Obviously, he has Saquon in the backfield, and they have positions they need to address in New York. But uh, I really like this move for the Giants. Go out and get a definite top five, top ten tight end whenever he's on the field. Yeah, it's Giants team that won a playoff game last year. Um, obviously a nice piece to add, one of the better tight ends in the league in a very few elite tight end league nowadays. Um, nice piece for Daniel Jones. Big bucks Daniel Jones. 
in in my opinion, that's that's crazy that the, the Raiders got rid of Darren Waller. I don't really understand why they would do that, especially bringing in Garoppolo. Um, but we saw they have Myers and they have run they have Myers Renfro and Adams. That's enough people to catch the ball, but I've heard there was some bad blood between McDaniels and Waller throughout the last season. I believe it. Did, Waller, you, see, did, did you see the thing on the animated player? Did you see the stuff with his wife? Yeah, Kelsey Plum, the marriage. They didn't invite Josh so, Daniels to and marry or to the wedding or something, and he told him to keep it hush hush. And McDaniel's went to the combine and was telling everyone about it, and that's how it got public. Oh, I didn't know all that. I just heard that he got signed, and then they they're like, "Yeah, McDaniel's doesn't doesn't really care about your marriage." And then Kelsey Plum was like, "He's probably just mad that he wasn't invited to the wedding." She yeah, tweeted that. Like that. It was something like that, and I heard the rest of that on uh, part of my take or McAfee this morning when I was listening to it. Is it, yeah, Josh that, so. is it because is it because of that? Say again. You see the Josh Jacobs tweet? No, I didn't see it. Or he's just like shit sad, bro. You think he's saying it because he's sad that he left or it's sad that they traded him over that? That's interesting. <laughs> I don't know. You never know either. Yep, that's crazy to me, but great move by the Giants. I think Darren Waller still has some gas on in the tank if he can uh, stay on the field. Lots of good stuff there out of the NFL in regards to the trades going on throughout the league. Let's jump into some of the action going on in the free agency market. Some players getting released, some players signing some extensions, some new contracts, lots of things to look forward to. The first point I got here is quarterback Jimmy Garoppolo has signed a three-year, $67.5 million deal with the Las Vegas Raiders, that includes $34 million in guaranteed cash. What do we think about this one? Garoppolo going from San Francisco over to LA, Las Vegas. Excuse me. Do we like the play? What do we think? I honestly like Garoppolo being reunited with Josh McDaniels. He goes and gets his guy. So now really, is he just a scapegoat if Josh McDaniels slips up early on? Or are they going to be a package deal when they get kicked out of... Uh, the Raiders was at Allegiant Stadium. Um, I, I like this move. Pretty safe move. Uh, I don't know if it's much of an upgrade from Derek Carr. It's just different. He has had success in the NFL, though. So while his skills and his stats may not be that great, he does get to the promised land. He hasn't won one himself, but he knows how to get there. So with all those weapons, I think he can't have a worse year than Carr had last year. I mean, this is just, I mean, in if I'm a Raiders fan and I'm hearing Rodgers, Brady, and then a couple, you know, a month later I get Jimmy Garoppolo, I'm kind of a little bit let down if I'm a Raiders fan. And that's just me. But uh, like you said, not necessarily the flashiest player. A guy that he's definitely gotten there with the a solidified 49ers team. I don't know if he's going to be able to do that with this Raiders team. But, I mean, props to him. He just continues to get crazy contracts no matter where he goes. So, um yeah, it's gonna gonna be interesting to see what he does in Vegas. I was just gonna say, think about Jimmy G living the life. Huff brought up a good point. Getting these contracts, he got to play with Tom Brady during the dynasty. Then he got to go play for the 49ers on a stacked team and living in San Francisco and going to Super Bowls. And now he gets to go play in Vegas and live there. He still has elite weapons everywhere he goes. I mean, just a great life for a guy that should be holding the clipboard. Dude, he wins. He he wins football games. That's what he does best, and uh, I I think he'll do a pretty good job in Vegas. I know it's tough division and a tough schedule, but I don't know. Guy knows how to win football games. He's shown it time and time again. Um, he he was also balling last year before he got injured. Yeah, I do think he, that the Raiders have a better season than they did last year, and I think Garoppolo will be pretty successful, especially in a McDaniel's offense. Curious to see how Garoppolo does there in Vegas with McDaniels. Lots to look forward to for Vegas this year. Next one I got is offensive tackle Andrew Wiley has signed a three-year, $24 million deal to join forces with his former offensive coordinator Eric Bieniemy in Washington with the Commanders. Another one for the Commanders. They have the Commanders and defensive tackle Darren Payne have come to an agreement on a four-year, $90 million contract extension. Some different moves there for the commanders. What do you guys think? Uh, obviously, Darren Payne, one of the better defensive tackles in the NFL, and the commanders just trying to solidify that defensive line they have there with Sweat and Payne and 
uh, Chase Young and trying to just bolster that defense and keep the young guys around and these playmakers in there. But I really like this move. I really like what Washington's been doing this offseason. I think they're another dark horse team in the NFC to uh, keep your eye on in the next season or two. All righty. And the next one, a former Steeler center back Cameron Sutton has signed a three-year, $33 million deal with the Detroit Lions. The Lions have also signed former Bears running back David Montgomery to a three-year, $18 million deal with $11 million in guarantees for Montgomery. Any comments on this one, boys? What do you think? Yeah, and this is another team you're going to have to look out for in the NFC North. Uh, Bears and Lions kind of adding and kind of keep going and addressing their issues and holes across. I think the Lions are a little more uh, further, or I think the Bears are a little further more down the rebuild road than the the Lions are, meaning the Lions are in a better uh, shape going in the next season, I think. I think with Goff and you get a guy like Montgomery in the backfield. I know they had Jamal Williams last year and uh, you get Montgomery up there with a couple skill players, and they're adding all over the field. They get a guy like Cameron Sutton, a veteran corner at this point of his career, and takes the big money to go up to Detroit. But definitely going to be a good team up there. They have young players on defense with Aiden Hutchinson, and uh, we know what he's capable of doing. We saw what he would, did throughout his rookie season. And I think those three teams, Commanders, Detroit, and Chicago, are very on the up and up in the NFC. Yeah, I like David David Montgomery swapping swapping teams there, or sw- swapping sides, I should say. Um, I like this Lions team. I mean, they were eight and nine last year. It's a good football team. Jared Goff's been playing well. He's a little underrated ever since he got traded from Los Angeles. You got to remember he was in a Super Bowl game or Super Bowl as well. Um, I like this Lions team. I think they can definitely win the division next year. Yeah, I agree. A good move there, and as we'll get to it later on, Jamal Williams moving on from this team. So that's a good tandem with Swift and Montgomery. Should be interesting to watch with the Jared Goff at the helm and then those uh, pretty pretty solid receiving core too. Solid stuff there. The next one I got, former Bills linebacker Tremaine Edmonds agrees to a four-year, $72 million deal with the Chicago Bears. Another ad here for the Bears. Oh, sorry. After getting rid of their first overall pick, what do we think? Love this move by the Bears. Like I said, a great offseason by them uh, following up on that trade they made. Um, I think people aren't, don't realize how good Tremaine Edmonds was and how much of a key he was to that Bills defense. He's everywhere on the ball. So how do you recla- replace Roquan Smith after trading him for a first-round pick? Or a second-round pick, I should say? You go get Tremaine Edmonds. So... They got rid of their guy. They brought someone else in, and they have those a, a boatload of picks for this upcoming season. So, excited to see how he does on this defense that needed some talent. That's that's a good point. Getting rid of Furukon Smith, they go out and get a definitely solidified top middle linebacker in Tremaine Edmonds. This is a guy that uh, he was my top free agent that I really wanted the Steelers to go out and spend the money and get. And uh, at least we're going to see him go to an NFC team uh, in Chicago. Like I said just building up, adding guys all over the field and. Edmonds gets the big money, so good for him, but definitely a guy I wanted to see coming over to the black and gold. I really thought we had a chance to get him to come and play with his brother here. Yeah, Huff, you wish you could have gotten that guy, but too much for a pretty penny, and the Bears have it to spend. Exactly. The Steelers weren't paying four years, $72 million. They were hoping they got like the discount where it's like, your brother plays here. How about four years, $60 million? And he was probably like, yeah, no, I'll go play in Chicago. It's a better place. All right, let's get to the news. Mike White, former Jets quarterback Mike White, has signed a two-year deal with the Miami Dolphins. South Florida native, so good for him to be home. And that's all. I, I think that's all we got on this one. Next up is sticking in the Big Apple. The New York Jets have agreed to terms with terms on a four-year deal with wide receiver Alan Lazard. Lazard was one of the names on Aaron Rodgers' wish list for the free agents for them to go after and get. The other names on the list include Odell Beckham Jr., Randall Cobb, and tight end Mercedes Lewis. I mean, if you're going to announce that Alan Lazard news, you might as well come out and say the most important piece of the Jets signing today. Yeah, well, we also heard him say today that this wasn't true. Um, 
he didn't have a wish list. They kind of asked him who who they think would, like, who he would recommend, if anything, and he just said a bunch of names. He didn't walk in there and demand these guys, and that's not really how it went down. That's what he, that's what he explained on the Pat McAfee show earlier today, at least. Yeah, I mean, obviously we know that his preferred, I mean, he said it this morning, like you said on McAfee, that his preferred destination is the Jets, and they go out and get his guy, one of his guys in Lazard, and you know, it's likely that you're going to see Cobb or two out of these next three guys in the in the New York Jets green jersey next year. But Jets on the up and up, getting Brees Hall back, Garrett Wilson, and now they got Alan Lazard, and they got that stud defense. So things are looking good in New York. Obviously, you get Aaron Rodgers there. It's going to be interesting to see what he does if uh, that trade does end up going through, which it's looking like it will, but just a matter of time at this point. For the New York Jets there. We'll see what happens with this uh, Aaron Rodgers such stuff as well. Next up, Calais Campbell released by the Baltimore Ravens. And he, yeah, and a few more moves that we can cover. Is Jarrett Stidham has agreed to a deal with the Denver Broncos. Not sure of the details on that deal at this time, but solid move there for the Broncos. Jonathan Jones resigns with the New England Patriots as a top center back. In two year, in a two year deal worth twenty million dollars. Ace, do you have any comment on this one? Uh, yeah, happy that the Patriots broke out the checkbook for uh, an elite corner here. Um, after letting J.C. Jackson walk the year previous, which actually turned out to be good, but Jonathan Jones has uh showed up to be. I I think if you look at the Pro Football Focus numbers, he's a top rated cornerback in the league last year and I know he's a bit smaller but his speed makes up for it and he locks up those uh, high end guys so key piece of the defense and one thing to note is do we have enough Joneses playing quarterback in New England we have Marcus Jones, Jack Jones and Jonathan Jones so you get the whole Jones trio out there and uh, it's going to be a tough day going through the air against the Patriots as they saw last year with that top ranked defense one of the top ranked defenses I should say well, let's stay with the Patriots here Ace Wide receiver Jacoby Myers will be leaving New England and joining the Las Vegas Raiders on a three-year deal worth $33 million, including $21 million in guaranteed money. What do you think about this loss here for the Patriots, Ace? Well, like Huff said to me the other day, he already has a win for the Raiders, and it was last year when he gave Mac Jones that pass that got him clobbered and sent into another dimension by Chandler Jones. But, um, yeah, Jacoby Myers, great career with the Patriots, great receiver, criminally underrated, but not worth that money. And to knock off a point you're going to get to later, I, I'm happy that we spent that on Juju Smith-Schuster, um, a more explosive threat at wide receiver than Jacoby Myers. Sure-handed wide receiver, ball catcher for sure, but he gets to play in the correct spot on that Vegas Raiders depth chart in second in the pecking order behind Devontae Adams, even with Renfro cutting into his production, so... He'll be successful, but I don't know if his numbers will remain the same as they did as the only weapon in New England in years past. Good stuff there, Ace. The next point I got is that veteran center Jason Kelsey has resigned with the Philadelphia Eagles coming back for another year. The Eagles also add former Seattle running back Rashard Penny, who will likely replace Miles Sanders as he is seeking a top-paying contract for his position. Any comments on this, guys? Rashad Petty as a starting back. Well, the yeah, you know, I was gonna say the Eagles. The, I saw at least today the, the right now they have Penny and uh, Boston Scott, Scott. go for next year. Yeah, and yeah, we saw today before when we sat down to record Miles Sanders to the Carolina Panthers. That's obviously uh, pretty relatively new news coming in over the past hour or so, and I think that's a great fit for him to go down to Carolina and step into there for a new role and. Um, a new head coach and uh, what's his name, Frank Reich, and kind of a whole new look for this Carolina Panthers team. But this Eagles team's been losing guys left and right, the coordinators on both sides of the ball. and But they're keeping a couple of pieces around. I don't know if it's going to be enough. It's going to be interesting to see how this Eagles team looks going into next year. To our Eagles listeners, I think you guys missed the uh, your chance right there. You were so close to getting a Super Bowl, but Patrick Mahomes showed you why he's the next GOAT. Um, yeah. Rashad Penny's going to step in here and be the lead back, and he's flashed some excellence, And if you guys recall, with the Seahawks especially, um, when Kenneth Walker was down. And before that, I think at the end of the last year, he kind of turned up a bit. But the thing is, he can't really stay on the field, so I don't know if you can trust him as a true workhorse. 
but definitely good to have in your mix. Um, but yeah, they're going to have to add more to that backfield. And uh, like you said, Hop, losing so much for the Eagles. I mean, they've lost Slay, they've lost Bradbury, they've lost um, Edwards. They've yeah, lost they got done. They 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 have Bradbury back. Yeah, they lost, Bradbury's they lost Gardner yeah. Johnson. Yeah, they lost. Well, no, I think Gardner Johnson is going to come back too. But they lost Slay. They, oh, never mind. They lost Slay. They lost Harkers. They lost Edwards. They lost Sanders. They lost the coordinators. I mean, how many more hits can this team take to be at the same level they were producing at this year? I know it's a deep team out there, but. I'm eager to see how this cap is controlled with so many big names tying up a lot of their money. We're going to see a lot, um, a lot to, or if Jalen Hurts is really that good next year. I mean, getting Kelsey back is, is crucial to his success as well. Yeah, you guys touched on Bradbury there for the Eagles. So the next one I got is Kansas City signs Jags Wire's uh, offensive tackle Jawan Taylor former Jaguar and second round pick to a four year eighty million dollar deal, opening door for opening the door for Orlando Brown to move elsewhere. I I've I've won I, I, I think oh. that's an interesting situation. You Ace, you don't I mean obviously Orlando Brown goes there from uh what was it, Baltimore to the Chiefs and wins the Super Bowl with them last year and now he's obviously seeking like the biggest contract for a left tackle in NFL history and I don't know where he's gonna end up, but I mean, he's going to get a bag, and now that Kansas City gets Sean Taylor, obviously it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Orlando Brown here. You know what's funny is they didn't have the money to like re-sign or keep around Tyree Kill the whole time, or they didn't have the money to keep around whoever, those Chiefs, Tyron Matthew, but they always find money to protect that, that franchise quarterback and Patrick Mahomes, and great move by the Chiefs. I mean, how do you make a Super Bowl champion team better? You bolster the line when the trenches... Um, Great signing here by the Chiefs, spending their money correctly to control both sides of the football. All righty, and with that, we have the Browns restructured quarterback Deshaun Watson's contract, creating nearly $36 million in cap space, source said. The cap conversion gives plenty of room for Cleveland to work in free agent to work in the free agency market. Watson was set to count $55 million against the Browns' salary cap in 2023, now that it's been dropped to the minimum $19.1 million. Anything on this? Just goes to show you this salary cap does not uh, really exist. Uh, they can turn anything into a signing bonus and go work in free agency. Ace, you alluded to it with what the Bruins did or trying to do with Taylor Hall and what the Lightning did last year in the NHL. So, um it's going to be interesting to see what the Browns do with all this money, but I think the Browns are more than a couple of pieces away, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, we didn't get to see a lot of uh, Deshaun Watson and the, that Browns team all healthy last year, but, um, yeah, it's a pretty tough division. It'll be interesting to see what, uh, what the Ravens do there, but obviously you yeah, have the powerhouse Bengals there, so... Um, Got to gear up. All righty. Next one I got is the Los Angeles Chargers are signing linebacker Eric Kendricks after being released by the Vikings. Following that, I have Mike McGlinchey has agreed to a five-year, $87.5 million deal to join the Denver Broncos. Do we think him and Russ are going to do anything special this year? Um... I do like this move for the Broncos. I do like this move for the Broncos. I think them spending all that money on the the offensive line and bolstering uh, what Russ had up there compared to last season is going to pay dividends. Obviously, you get Sean Payton in there as a head coach. It's going to be interesting to see what he can do uh, after taking a little bit of a break from football. But um, I'm back on. I mean, I never really left. I've, I'm still a Russ guy, so I'm definitely still rooting for him and the Broncos next year. Huff, um... I think this is actually a great move, especially those tackles that can help out in the screen passing game. But people forget. He's, ne him. he's never had a tackle as good as him. Yeah, and the other thing people forget is Javante Williams was injured for most of the season last year. When he comes back, this is great news for him too. I mean, the explosive running back getting a big old lineman is going to help in the passing game. It helps everywhere. If you can help in those trenches, it's going to help a lot. And uh, with Sean Payton coming in, I'm expecting a lot out of this Broncos team in a very tough division. 
yeah, looking for success from the Broncos this year. But what do we think about the Falcons? This next one is the Falcons have added former Cincinnati Bengals safety Jesse Bates on a four-year $64 million deal, while also adding Washington Commanders quarterback Taylor Heineke. Interesting move, the second one. Um, excited to see Bates go to this team, get that resurrect that Falcons defense. They had pieces last year at times. They were playing well. I know you guys all cashed on them a lot last year on the money line and with the points, those Falcons, if you remember correctly, seeing them on the weekly card for the boys. But uh, Jesse Bates is a game changer. It's going to affect that Bengals defense, which is playing very well. It's going to help out the Falcons. And then Heineke might just walk into a starting job there. I don't know what you guys think about that. Yeah, they obviously still have Desmond Ritter down there. So um, you're going to want to see what, what their what their rookie quarter or their not their rookie quarterback anymore, obviously, but what their quarterback can do that they drafted pretty pretty high, I think. Second round. Um, yeah, not too bad. Um but yeah, Taylor Heineke's obviously uh, going to put up a fight down there. We've seen him win win some games in Washington. He got to a playoff game two years ago and put up a good fight against Tom Brady. Yeah, but uh, Jesse Bates is going to eat down there in Atlanta, especially in a division with weak quarterbacks. I know we got... Get paid, too. We got Derek Carr down there. Going there, 64. He deserves it. He deserves it. Yeah, definitely, but that's nice. Think Go about ahead. who he gets to play against now. Whoever the hell Carolina rolls out, it's going to be someone young. Um, Derek Carr and Baker Mayfield, Jesse Bates is going to eat in this division. All righty, a couple more moves here to go over. The next one is quarterback Sam Darnold joins the 49ers as an elite veteran backup in case of emergency with Lance and Purdy. What do we think about this one? Anything? Um, obviously, I don't think the 49ers have too much confidence in Trey Lance, and they're looking to go in the next season, I think, with Brock Purdy after the success that he had last year. But you get a veteran in there with Sam. He's Dawson. out. Who? Um, Brock Purdy. Oh, out the yeah, season. I mean, Purdy, yeah, he's not going to start. He's out for the entire season? I, I, I'm I, pretty sure I saw six months added on, and he was already halfway. Uh, dang, I saw he just got the surgery recently, so I knew he was going to miss the start of the year, but... I mean, we've seen a number of quarterbacks slide into that Kyle Shanahan offense. It's going to be interesting to see what happens if Sam Darnold has to slide in there. It's just some good stability behind some questions. A little look up from Brock Purdy. All righty, let's move forward. The next one is the Cincinnati Bengals safety. Vaughn Bell has agreed to a deal to join the Carolina Panthers. No details on this deal uh, here for me right now, but let's move forward to our next one. We have the Saints re-signing quarterback James Winston to a one-year, $8 million deal. Cowboys are signing back linebacker Leighton Vander Etch, sources said, giving him a two-year deal worth $11 million. They get back one of their top defenders here. What do we think? Mackie, you want to comment on this one? Yeah, we uh, dished him off last year. Um, but he's he's been a good part of that um that linebacking core that we had for those few years. Came in behind Sean Lee. Sean Lee was a great mentor for him um coming in as a rookie. Um uh, definitely one of the better linebackers out there. I, I I I like that we got him back. I liked him on, as a cowboy, so this is uh this is nice for us. Yeah, I think that's a good move for Dallas to bring him back. Obviously we've seen the off season Dallas is having at the Tony Pollard gets the franchise tag and just kind of allude to this next point while we're kind of on the Cowboys here. Uh, Zeke's expected to be cut by the Cowboys after seven seasons with them, kind of the bell cow for that team, America's team, if you want to say it, over the past so many years. And um, it's going to be very— Maybe if you want to say it. I mean, they are, but, like, I feel like you have to win to be America's team. All one right, one day, right, Mac, right. you won the— Yeah, it's still America's team. There, yeah, the that nickname started in the '90s for good reason. Like they were winning. But back to my point, I just think it's gonna be so weird to see Zeke in another jersey. I feel like he is like the Cowboys. Like I, I just, it, it's gonna be so weird. I don't know why, but of running backs, it's not usually that weird for me to be like, oh yeah, they're definitely gonna go to another team. 
I honestly thought Zeke for some reason was going to be with that Cowboys team for his whole career just because of the relationship yeah. that he had with Jerry Jones. And just like the type of player that he was for that for that organization. I mean, it's definitely like the hardest goodbye as a Cowboys fan I've had in a while. Um, you, you just see him. And he, he's just supposed to be a Cowboy. He, he looks like a Cowboy. Seeing him in, in another uniform is definitely going to be really weird. And uh, it sucks to see him go, but, you know, Tony Pollard's that dog. So um excited to see what he can do. Is he going to go like, like the Cardinals or somewhere random as fuck? No, Zeke, there will be some good fits for Zeke. I think Zeke is going to eat next year. I think yeah, he's going to eat next year. It's going to be a comeback player of the year type thing. Um, he's he's really good, I think, in my opinion. He, does, he plays very differently, ground and pound, and he really helped out Pollard to his success. I, I truly wonder if Tony Pollard can take on the full workload at the size he is. Um, hope for the best, never hope for injury, but I could I could see that coming about or at least losing some pop in his legs. I like the two-headed snake they had in Dallas. Yeah, it was definitely a nice committee that they had going. But, um, yeah, we'll see what Tony Pollard can do. I like him. I think he's been, been all right. So, um, like you said, I'm carrying a lot more workload now, now that Zeke's gone. So, it'll be interesting to see what he can do. All right, is this the last thing? little Baker Mayfield news. Yeah, curious to see where Zeke Elliott ends up after possibly being cut here. But let's jump over to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers signing Baker Mayfield, just one year, $8.5 million. Do you think he's going to be able to fill the shoes of Tom Brady? Is he going to start? Yeah, he's gonna he start. will start, yes. Will he fill the shoes of Tom Brady? Yes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Mackie, what were we saying earlier? I keep holding out hope for him to be good. I don't know why, but I just have to maybe accept the fact that he's not. Ace, that's so funny because right after you texted me that, my my friend texted me. He was like, "I really want to, I, I want to root for him. I want to have hope for him." And I was like, "My my friend just texted me the same exact thing." But um, yeah, he's a guy you want to root for. Um, obviously, he I, people think that he got screwed from the Browns. I've had a lot of hope for him in the past few years. I just I can't root. I I, I can't support him anymore after last season. I mean, this, 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 last this year. has to be his the last same chance. team this year. Has to be. not as good. This has to be, yeah. Well, had some success with the Rams, so you never know. It's interesting. We'll, we'll, um, it'll be interesting to see how he does. I think they're going to be the worst team in the league this year, though. Bold take, but I bet you it does come out of that division. But we'll see. You might be right. You might be right. All right, I think that's just going to about wrap up everything we got this week. Tons of com stuff coming down in the NFL for free agency and trade talk. Lots in the NHL as the playoffs approach. MLB coming up as well, the opening day just weeks away. March Madness is here, and we got everything to cover it all. That's about it from me. You guys got anything else to add? No, that's going to do it for me. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. Like I said, March Madness gets rolling tomorrow. Make sure you're staying tuned to the social medias, Twitter, Instagram story for all the plays. Obviously, we're going to have a lot of plays getting as stuff gets rolling around noon tomorrow and Friday uh, and for the round of 64. So definitely stay tuned to everything. Best of luck to everyone on their uh, bets in March Madness. Uh, let's go win some money. Uh, and we'll see you guys next week. The next two days are the two best days of the entire year, every single year. Um, so I hope everyone has success in that, but I'll be enjoying the fuck out of it. Yeah, I can't wait to get those picks from Mackie and Huff when I'm sitting in the office and uh, looking for something to throw on. So I'll definitely be tuning in. I hope you guys do as well. A um, lot more NFL news to come as free agency only just started. We'll definitely stay on top of that and keep you guys updated in weeks to come is that will heavily impact the draft, the rest of this offseason, and then the next season as well. So we're ready in all leagues, and we got those NHL and NBA cards rolling as well. So looking forward to a good March Madness bracket, tournament, and uh, contest we got going. So catch you guys later. And that's going to do it for us on this episode of Hit the Books. Thank you to everyone who tunes in each and every week. Without you, we wouldn't be able to do what we do here. So please like, share, and subscribe wherever you can. And don't forget to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for our plays each and every night in the NHL, NFL, MLB, 
NBA, college basketball, and college football. Thank you again, and see you next week.